On the nights of the 13th and 14th of March 1941, Clydebank suffered the most devastating air attack ever to take place on Scottish soil. Luftwaffe bombers dropped 500 metric tons of high explosives and more than 2,000 incendiary devices. On the banks of Glasgow's river lie the most famous shipyards in the world, where since the days of wooden walls and sail, Clyde built has meant speed and strength and safety, and all the world knows it. And Clyde men are teeming back into the yards where 10,000 hammers roar their song of prosperity. And these are the men who today are carrying on the tradition of fine work that has borne the Clyde to its pinnacle of fame. When they built those great ships, they towered over the town. You know, they really towered over the town. You saw them uh, from whatever angle you approached the town. Scottish rivers, it's dearest to me. Nothing but work, work, work. We had the best shipyards in, in probably in Europe or wherever else. We had it all here. One ship after another was going out. John Brown's 5,000 employees. Singers at its peak, 40,000 employees. That's a lot of people and a lot of social interaction. People were close knit, yes, yeah, especially shipyard workers. They were very close knit, yes. It was a very good town to live in. Plenty of entertainment, plenty of dance halls. There were no doors closed in the tenements at that time. And I could get into any house in the street and walk into it. And we'd all know each other. We lived in one Napier Street. It was a three-storey building. Five children in a two-room and kitchen. We lived two up the middle, which was a room and kitchen with an outside toilet. But it was fine. It's not as if you knew anything else. As the growing spectre of Nazism cast its shadow over Europe, the Clyde Bank community would be changed forever. This morning, the British ambassador in Berlin handed the German government a final note, stating that unless we heard from them that they were prepared at once to withdraw their troops from Poland, a state of war would exist between us. I have to tell you now that no such undertaking has been received and that consequently this country is at war with Germany. At school we were given drills, as you would imagine. But in terms of uh, the population as a whole being drilled for an eventuality of an air raid, they were non-existent. I installed a shelter for the protection of my mother and father in the adjoining house. I got the people to Anderson shelters. I seriously advise you to take a gas mask, but I think we are pretty safe here. It's the length for one thing. And then it's England or more for than Scotland. I don't see how we can escape yeah. it. I think if we lie flat on the floor in our own homes, we're as safe as anywhere. We've all our plans made. The lady upstairs is a stir Well, I hope to goodness it would come and be done with it and let everybody's son and man. On the 30th of March, I was working overtime in John Brown's yard. And I come out of the yard about quarter to nine, I would think. And it was a lovely moonlight night. And I th remember thinking to myself, a lovely night for an air raid. The first sound was the sound of the morning minis, the sire, and this dreadful moan, you know, and coming and going. Nobody really thought much about it because it had gone before. I thought war was always fought away in far, far places, and nobody got killed. That was only in films. People got killed until March the 13th, 1941. Then I knew what war was all about. The, the bombing was fierce and the noise dreadful. It was looking like falling flame or rain that was in fire. As the bombs rained down, fire was returned by the Clyde-built Polish battleship, ORP Purin. Her crew members also fought valiantly to douse the flames at John Brown shipyard. Their actions are thought to have prevented its total destruction. So I stayed in the church for a short time and became afraid and ran home all the way through the school blazing, the singer Woodyard blazing, and St Stephen's Chapel blazing. 
The last thing I remember was my mother uh, putting me to bed. It would be about midnight now, and she went out for a breath of air. That was the last time I saw her. There was a, a policeman that I we, they knew the family, he knew me, and he told me, he said, I think your whole family's under there. They all congregated in the Anderson shelters. That was 12 of them with two dogs. A mine landed right in my garden, wiped them away completely, destroyed my own shelter. My father was killed and my mother was very badly injured, a broken leg, broken, broken nose. And they took her away to Ayrshire, but he was killed. But the family, all we got of the family in the adjoining Andersons were the girl's finger and with a, a ring on it and the girl's hair. Of the 1,200 people who lost their lives over the whole of Clydeside, 528 were from Clyde Bank alone, and more than a thousand others were seriously injured. By dawn on Sunday the 15th of March, out of the 12,000 homes in Clyde Bank, only seven remained undamaged, and up to 35,000 people were forced to flee. There were hundreds and hundreds of people coming from, obviously, Clyde Bank. All the tram cars had been taken over, taxis had been taken over, barrows, everything. Men and women in nightdress with grey blankets around them, children in prams, mattresses on top of taxis. It was, it was like refugees all day long. Despite the terrible cost borne by the people of Clybank, their spirit and determination brought them back to work. At least I think the morale was better you know, after the blitz than what it was before it, because I'll tell you this, the people came together and helped one another. People did turn up for their work the next day, and the day after, and they returned and they walked great distances, they travelled great distances to actually come back here to their work, because they needed to. Within two weeks, war effort productivity in Clyde Bank had returned to pre-blitz levels. The Nazis had failed. On the banks of Glasgow's river lie the most famous shipyards in the world. But since the days of wooden walls and sail, high built, has meant speed and strength and safety, and all the world knows it. The silence and oppression is past, and five men are teaming back into the yard. The 10,000 hammers roar their song of prosperity. Here, week by week, there is taking shape the 552, sister ship of the Queen Mary. She will be faster and more comfortable than any superliner that has ever been built. The finest ship that has ever come out of a British yard, a vessel of which British seamen will be proud. And these are the men who today are carrying on the tradition of fine work that has borne the Clyde to its pinnacle of fame. What do they think about being back on the job again after years of unemployment? Ask them. Well, it's good to be back at work again, isn't it? Oh, and it's a good job to see what getting on again. We've got a couple of years good luck in front of us. After all them lean years we've been having, I thought we never going to work anywhere. Well, it's a good job, and I hope it'll last longer. That's what they're all thinking. The party marches back to a new prosperity.